I would first like to start with um, introducing um, my organization and uh, having a few words on, on, on the environment. And then afterwards, I would go on and explain to you a bit on what, uh, what we could actually, um, what and how we can um, influence uh, European policies and who are the actors that we uh, are targeting. And then as, uh, as the end, I would like to talk a bit on certain topics that are at the moment at the political agenda, and then we can hand over to the uh, discussion. Um, the Initiative for Science in Europe is a joint effort of various European learned societies from all uh, disciplines, ranging from physics, for example, we have the European Physical Society as a member, or uh, biology, um, for example, European Plant Science Organization, or EMBO, um, but also ranging over to social sciences, to education research, the European Education Research Association is also one of the members, um, European Mathematical Society, Euroscience um, is a more complete uh, list. And the an idea uh, behind our organization is um, to uh, join uh, forces uh, for um, uh, providing a, a, a voice of, of scientists at the, at the European level. Um, uh, we collect and, and structure the voice of science. So my job is uh, to a large extent to listen to the different um, disciplines to find out what are the real common um, problems, common concerns that have to be solved at the at European level. Um, and also we have to be the intermediate between the policy world and the science world to find out what is really realistic to be to influence and to advocate in the involvement in, of scientists in, in the policies of the European Commission, European Parliament and uh, Council. Mm. Now, I would first um, start with some an example of our activities. Actually, our uh, largest uh, campaign so far was on the uh, budget for, the, um, uh, for European research. Uh, that was in uh, end of 2012, beginning of 2013, uh, when the um, debate on the EU budget um, became most prominent when it was about um, to define the budget between the agriculture budget, between the cohesion budget, uh, but also between competitiveness budget at the highest level, including also research funding. And at uh, that moment, um, of course, the, uh, there are some lobbies, for example, some countries that are strong in uh, benefiting on agriculture research, they lobby for that. Uh, and also uh, countries lobbying for cohesion uh, and research, but uh, the problem is that research uh, as such, um, mm. research and innovation, mm. somehow there was a risk that uh, that would not uh, be visible in the scene at all, and therefore an easy target uh, to uh, cut, um, also considering that some countries, um, for example, the UK wanted to cut the uh, EU budget as a whole, uh, giving additional pressure on, on that. Mm -hmm. And uh, at that moment, we started um, mm -hmm. a campaign to create um, an, a bit of an, basically to say, to create noise and awareness on research in the debate so that it doesn't, um, it doesn't just fall under the table. Mm -hmm. And we um, assembled together the mm -hmm. Nobel laureates, 50 Nobel laureates who um, uh, signed a, a letter on our initiative and uh, we brought that to the media and then we set up a, a petition for um, a pub, uh, for citizens and researchers to to sign and in the end we we reached uh, here it is uh, still at the count at 110 but in the end uh, we reached um, over 150,000 um, people mm -hmm. and um, with together with these tools uh, we then um, went to the heads of state and government offices and requested for, for meetings for handover. 
Um, this worked at European level. We, we met with the uh, three EU presidents. Um, it worked with, with some countries. It worked, for example, in, in France, uh, where the, this petition was handed over to the French president. But uh, essentially, it, it created media attention on, on the topic, and it had some influence in that in the final declaration, it was uh, specifically stated that the research uh, budget will uh, not be decreased to uh, to the levels uh, mm. uh, in in FP7 in the uh, previous program. Mm. Um, uh, so that uh, that is like um, one of the biggest uh, projects that we were running so far. But in in general, um, I would like now like to give you an overview of what what can be actually done uh, to influence. Uh, policies in what kind of different approaches one can um, uh, we can take. The, the first approach I just presented would be campaigns. It doesn't always need to be such a, uh, a large campaign on a, on a very general uh, topic, but it could also be more specific. Um, and here we um, we uh, need prominent people, the, the media, uh, to keep a message simple and also important uh, to be uh, at the right moment. This is the most, imp uh, most difficult um, uh, to really monitor the developments and uh, be ready at a certain um, moment where, when it is important to act. Mm -hmm. A second way of influencing policies is what I call here constant dripping versus stone. Mm, uh, there are many policy events, policy conferences happening in Brussels, elsewhere in the EU presidencies, and um, like newcomers often expect that uh, such events or at, at one point there would be a declaration and then everything changes. That doesn't really happen, um, the, but the real, um, uh, like, the real uh, what really go, is going on is that for many uh, for many things uh, you have to bring it over and over and over again at different events. Speak at different events. It, uh, uh, best at e events where you um, can reach uh, those who are not yet convinced. And that's uh, it's often a, um, what I see a, a problem that some people are uh, only talking to those that are already convinced and think they can influence uh, that way something. But that's, that's also a way which uh, takes much longer and where it's also much di more difficult, of course, to see the immediate result what is coming out. Uh, or the third possibility that I would say is really to uh, do background work and uh, deliver sound expert reports. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's again something which we really need proper planning, where you need the time, you need those people that uh, really know about it. You cannot just uh, send out any statement. I mean, you, you can, but um, a lot of organizations do. Uh, but in the end, uh, uh, people in, uh, at decision maker positions, they really clearly also uh, question the background, what the arguments are uh, really based on evidence. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so. But it, it is a third uh, possibility in any case to influence policies that we are starting uh, doing time to time. Mm -hmm. So I think important also to understand the whole scene is uh, to think about whom to influence and whom to influence for which specific topic. Mm -hmm. uh, there is actors as the European Commission that um, um, first uh, prepares uh, uh, proposals that also runs uh, the programs and the uh, research funding programs is, is one of the actors which is certainly um, easier to uh, approach because you know, you know who, who is responsible for what and uh, there are established uh, channels to contact them. Then the European Parliament is one of the two decision makers at EU level Mm, where you can also easily find your uh, peers and, and um, uh, talk to them, convince uh, them, or also start a campaign targeting the European Parliament, where uh, you can, for example, uh, where we could send uh, encourage researchers to send emails to their deputies. Mm -hmm. Then, um, what is often overlooked but uh, very important is the uh, role of the EU member states. Uh, people often forget that 
actually, even though it, and there, it's about European uh, policy questions, um, at, uh, representatives of the different EU member states um, have uh, are also one of the two decision-making uh, bodies. And um, it, it has a general tendency, it's, it's often that the European Parliament is anyways in, in favor of uh, our concerns, but the different member, EU member states there, uh, we sometimes have, have problems um, convincing them and reaching them, and they are often uh, the ones that are um, uh, stopping uh, um, the progress. And uh, here, in the same time, it is also more difficult to find the different uh, interlocutors, because um, uh, you have to know the uh, systems in, in various countries, and uh, this is also something that we are um, a lot working on to, to find the right uh, people who has, have influences in, in different key countries. And then another th I think for some topics, we actually don't really, can't really influence um, the decision making bodies because it's not about a law, but it's, it's more about a change of, of culture or it's uh, also a change that uh, concerns um, the institutions, universities, funders, Mm, even though they are, of course, embedded in the national systems, but they also have their, um, their liberty to, to take decisions, and they are, uh, for many topics, also a, a target. Then the, the public um, and the media, when you, uh, uh, we should not forget that in the end, um, politicians will also not uh, uh, just... Um, uh, decide on sympathy, whom to give the uh, more funds, but they uh, listen, of course, to their constituency. And um, if the public uh, understands more the importance of, uh, of research, then we will, uh, in, in the long term, also have uh, more uh, chances uh, for uh, our efforts to increase uh, research budgets. And the same goes also with the media, which has, of course, a, um, quite an important function as a facilitator. And then in some, in some cases, we may also Im uh, need to influence, I said here, ourselves, the uh, scientific community, the informal uh, structures, uh, for example, that is in, in regarding to topics that I may briefly mention afterwards, such as research assessment, such as the Mm, kind of use and misuse of, of impact factor and metrics. This is a topic that also um, a, each and every person who is on a selection panel has to, has to consider uh, him or herself. Mm, uh, so then I would briefly like to, to come in to, to mention some, uh, some of the topics. Uh, first, uh, one topic is about Horizon 2020, about the EU research funding program. And there uh, will, will in the next, um, let's say, one, uh, one year, one and a half year, there, there will certainly be some activity, mainly because the current commissioner, uh, Moidas, um, uh, will be in, in office um, only for the next five years. And this is his chance now at the midterm review of the current uh, research funding program to, to leave his mark and to, and to change something. And, um, there, the midterm review means mainly to, uh, to look at what is currently going on in research funding and from, based on that, argue what, what could be uh, changed and it will not be uh, like uh, total structural changes, but at least small changes that could then later lead to at the next um, uh, EU funding uh, program scheme to uh, larger schemes and there we will uh, we will try to collect the feedback from the scientific community and uh, structure that and then based on that argue what could be uh, changed. Mm. The challenge is of course here to, to really pro properly collect it and, um, uh, and uh, build this evidence. Mm. Um, and some ideas that, that could be changed is for example the European Research Council could ha have a larger mandate and also get more programs as, as and be defined as the uh, main science uh, science or basic research instrument, um, or 
uh, then one challenge that I see and that, that I often hear is concerns from and the communities is that in uh, many funding schemes there's a certain tendency to privatize the EU uh, research funding um, uh, with the so-called joint technology initiatives or in, in general the balance between um, let's say more uh, uh, research that is more influenced by, uh, by innovation by companies and the more basic uh, research. Um, uh, then Another topic that, that is currently a lot in, in discussion is about science and scientific advice in the European Union. So how, does, um, uh, how are decisions in uh, various uh, fields, not, not only in science, but in, in um, various fields of the European Union are really based on uh, scientific results or not? Mm. Uh, there has been a lot of discussion when um, the position of a scientific advisor at the European uh, level was not continued and now there will be a new uh, board of scientific advisors at the European level but uh, there are a lot of uh, questions open and um, how will actually researchers be, uh, be involved in this structure of giving uh, science, uh, scientific advice to the European Union um, and we will also organize a, a we have a working group and we'll organize a workshop on, on this topic to uh, propose the European Commission uh, how, how to really properly implement these ideas that are already on the table. Um, other topics I mentioned already, um, research assessment. I, I get often a lot of feedback on that uh, people um, are concerned that the current system relying on metrics leads to various developments that are not in, going in the right direction. Then scientific visa, this is also currently right at the moment at the final stage to find out and how to improve the conditions for research outside of the European Union to come to the EU. Um, and then, um, yeah, I would also like to mention maybe at the end that we are also trying to kind of uh, Provide, uh, um, provide uh, information transfer to, uh, to the individual scientists with a large scale email list. This is this no cuts on research uh, EU email list. This was created from this petition that I mentioned earlier where we reached 150,000 researchers in all over Europe and we maintained the, um, the email addresses uh, of uh, those who, uh, who agreed to be kept informed. And um, uh, through that contact, um, we also try to set up a, a regular newsletter to inform about the real most important policy in issues in, in Europe and the possibilities for researchers to actually um, influence the, the uh, decisions. So that is also kind of a basis for further, further campaigns. And I um, was thinking of establishing a portal for all uh, European research organizations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, this is uh, just a, also one idea that I think um, people uh, could create a kind of structural input is to um, convince the research funders that they would uh, pay the membership in different organizations out, uh, out of the um, research grant, which could also create more uh, strengthen the different uh, organizations uh, and learned societies. Um, yes, as a final uh, slide, I would also I also have some questions to you and to the audience as regards to organizing campaigns. And one way, as I showed at the beginning, is uh, to create a petition on different uh, topics, and once you reach a certain number, you can. Mm, I bring that to uh, the politicians, but another way of uh, of influencing people is directly to uh, to uh, bring a, a larger number of people to contact them. For example, to send emails or letter to your member of the parliament, mm -hmm. and uh, or more directly to uh, contact your ministries and uh, politician. Mm -hmm. um, and I, one of the questions that I would also have to the audience is. What, what would be the conditions uh, that you would uh, 
really also to be ready to invest a little bit of time to, um, for example, to email your uh, member of the European Parliament on a certain issue that we would provide some background information on. Okay, thank you.